set me on fire, Jesus. I need the fire of the Holy Ghost, the fire of the day of Pentecost to fall in my life fresh tonight, Lord. Father, let your Holy Spirit fall right now. Let the Holy Ghost from heaven begin to fall in this room right now, Lord. Set the dry wood on fire, Lord. Burn up the sacrifice. Come, Lord. Why don't you lift up your voice right now and say to me, come, Lord. Yeah. 
I'll tell you what I want you to do. The Lord's in the house tonight. I want everybody, if you can and you don't mind, and you can get a little bit of dancing room. I'm not talking about getting down. I'm just talking about getting free. Let's get free from you. Come on. Whoa. Just, I don't think you just read what I read. It said he rescued us. Woo! Put it back up there. He rescued us with a strong right hand. Sing hallelujah. Won't you listen to me, friend? Listen. Unless you've ever been rescued by the Lord, you don't have nothing to praise him for. But if you're here tonight and he's rescued you, I want you to let him know it. Hallelujah. Sing the song. Sing out. 
while we're singing, the Lord is rescuing even while we're singing. Yes, he, is. he is. He's rescuing some of you up here even while we're singing. Do it one more time. Come on. One, two, three. Rise, O oh Lord. Mm -hmm. Arise, 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 arise. Oh Lord. Arise with healing in your wings. Arise. Your wings, Lord. I want you 
wonder if we can lift up a shout tonight. Come on. Lift up a shout. Lift up a shout. Father, we worship you, Father. We thank you for the blood of Jesus. 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 We thank you for the name of Jesus. For there is no other name, no other name, no other name.
some incense for you, Lord. Yeah. Haven't you always loved me? Haven't you always cared? Why should I be anxious? Why should I despair? Haven't you been good? Written on the pages of my history is story upon story of what you've done for me. Haven't you been good? Oh, my Lord, haven't you been good? Oh, my Lord, haven't you Yes, you have. And haven't you been faithful throughout the years, hearing my petitions and sharing my tears? Haven't you been? The robin and the sparrow have taught me this truth. There's no need to worry, you always come through. Petitions, hearing my petitions, sharing my tears. Haven't you been good? Haven't you been good? The robin and the sparrow sing. The robin and the sparrow have taught me this truth. There's no need to worry. Always come through. <laughs> Haven't you been good? Now sing it to him, oh my Lord. Your love, like 
let the sun fall over everyone. So we get your love. If you're listening to the radio tonight and you're a sinner and you don't know Jesus, his love is pouring over you right now. Oh, your love, like the sun. Sing it, church. It's pouring over. Right now, he's pouring over you. Say a big amen to that. <clears throat> you know, there's one thing for sure. Anytime you pray, God hears you. And may I take it further? Anytime you pray, God always answers. He may answer the way you want him to. He may not answer it the way you want him to. And then at times he may do nothing which is still an answer to your prayer. Why? Because he's watching over us for our good. He is so good. Amen? You may be seated. Hallelujah. What a sweet presence of the Lord in this house tonight. Welcome, welcome to the Brownsville Revival. This may very well be the sweetest place on earth. I've been coming here now for seven years, and I've never walked in this building or even on this campus that I didn't feel the presence of the Lord. I don't know any other place I can say that about but this place. There's always an open heaven at Brownsville, and we thank God for it. Can you say amen? amen. Hallelujah. Yeah, go ahead. God's worthy. We want to give you an opportunity tonight to sow into the ministry here at Brownsville. We're going to be receiving an offering, and we want you to give the best offering that you can give tonight. The Lord has blessed us this evening with an awesome man of God all the way from the other side of the world, all the way from Australia to share the word of God with us. It's going to be a wonderful service, and we want you to sow a seed into the ministry of Brownsville tonight. I want to read just a scripture here. I'm not going to preach, but it says in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 5, If a man also strive for masteries, yet is he not crowned, except he strive lawfully. I read that yesterday morning, and I said, wow, that's a keeper. You know, when you read something, sometimes it just, it just gets a hold of you. It doesn't matter how hard you try, if you don't play by the rules, you're not going to be a winner. Doesn't matter how important you are in the game of baseball, if you play with a corked bat, you're going to get thrown out of the game. And there's lots of people that want to walk in prosperity. You know, they want to have new cars and new houses and new everything. They want to walk in prosperity, but they want to do that without playing by the rules. And the rule is this. God said, Jesus said, give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over will men give unto your bosom. So if you want to be a master, how many of you want to be a master in prosperity? 
You want to be a master in the good things of life. Sure, all of us want that. I'm not telling you that God wants all of us to be multimillionaires. He might want some of us to be multimillionaires. But I'm telling you this, God wants you to be a master of the life that you live. And you become that by playing by the rules. He said, if you sow sparingly, you reap sparingly. If you sow bountifully, you reap bountifully. He said, if you give to God, he'd open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing on you so great that you couldn't receive it. Now, he said that about tithe, and everybody ought to pay tithe. That's part of the rules. But if you're not from Brownsville, we don't want you paying your tithe in this offering tonight because you ought to pay your tithes in your home church. But he also said that promise about open the windows of heaven. He said, your tithe and offerings. So when you give an offering tonight, when you sow into the ministry of this great revival church and our speaker tonight, when you sow a seed, God's going to open the windows of heaven. He's going to pour out his blessing on you. You're going to win. You're going to get the crown because you're going to play by the rules tonight. How many of you want to believe that? Amen. Let's stand together this evening. If you've got your offering ready, I want you to give the best offering you can give. How many of you want to see this revival, these Friday night services continue? Yeah, come on. I want to see them continue. They continue as you sow a seed into this offering tonight. Maybe you want to think about it and sow a little bigger seed because we want to see God continue to move in a mighty way in this church. Hold your offering up. Let's speak a blessing. Lord, here are people that are playing by the rules tonight. Lord, they're not asking for something for nothing. They're not asking for a free lunch. They're not playing with a cork bat. These are people playing by the rules. They're sowing seed. And you said, Lord, if they sowed, you would sow back to them so that they could reap a bountiful blessing. Now I bless them with that rich harvest in Jesus' name. Amen. Bring your offerings. Well, one, two, three. One I put my face. Yeah. 
Is that good worship or is that good worship? I want everybody to stand, if you will, please. I want you to take just a few moments and be friendly. I just sense that there's people here tonight that really needs to be loved on. So I want you to take some little bit of time and just be friendly with one another. Will you do that? Ladies with ladies especially and men with men. Come on, guys. Would you stand back up one more time? Let's give the Lord a big clap offering, will you? Come on. Praise you, Lord. Praise you, Lord. You're good, Jesus. My, my, my. I want you to just turn around and look. Now, this is with our Bible school being gone for the summer, and this is the middle of summer vacation. But look at this. This place is full tonight. This is great. God bless all of you. Welcome to Brownsville. You may be seated. We want to take this opportunity tonight to give all of you a good greeting and a good welcome. On the behalf of myself and all of us here on the pastoral staff, all of our officials of the church, we welcome you to Brownsville. God has done some powerful things here, but I've got news for you, he's not through. He's still moving powerfully. Tonight, Jensen Franklin was supposed to be our speaker, and he called me this week about Tuesday or Wednesday, and he said, Brother John, I hate to do this so bad, but I've got to beg off. So then uh, he said, I just apologize, but I'm in a situation where I've got to beg off. And I said, okay. So then I prepared to speak tonight. <laughs> I said, I prepared to speak tonight. Last week I was supposed to speak and I had a sermon. It took me seven hours. I got my sermon, was ready to go. And then tonight I was going to speak a message entitled, How Evil Spirits Are Loosed. And I'll come back to that. I'll come back and deal with that on how evil spirits are loosed. It's interesting. It's good. 
may I say it's a good sermon. I ain't preaching yet, but it's good. But then my friend David Cartledge flew in, and I, Brent and I went out. Brent and I went out last night with he and his wife, and he's going to be with us this Sunday. And after going out with them last night, I said, David, you've got to preach Friday night. This man, God has got his hand on him in such a powerful way. I don't say this about a lot of people because, I, listen, friend, I know thousands of ministers, but I don't say this about everybody. But I have a lot of confidence in David Cartledge. He's just an apostolic figure. He's a father, father figure in the ministry, and he's somebody that you need to hear from. He's got something to say, and I want you to give him a good, rousing, Brownsville welcome, David Cartledge. Yeah, like that. Take a liberty. Thank you. Well, it is a great honor to be here, an awesome honor. My wife and I have been many times during the revival, and uh, uh, a number of times this year, in fact, for other meetings. And it's been, it's just an awesome opportunity and a wonderful privilege that I feel to have this unexpected chance to speak to you the word of the Lord. I take that very seriously, and I'll do my best to unload my heart in the best way I possibly can under the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And I look for God's blessing to be manifest in us before we are through, that this word of the Lord will get deep into our spirit. Hallelujah. I come from Australia. Uh, you can tell that. <laughs> And my wife and I have been coming to the U.S. many, many times. This is, our, this is my 52nd trip to the U.S. And we love this country. God's hand is on America. America has blessed the world phenomenally. And its best days are yet to come. Well, thank you, both of you. Its best days are yet to come. one reason why we're here, because we believe in what God is doing in the USA. There is something rising. And the Brownsville Revival was an incredible catalyst of that all over the nation. Wherever we go, we find deposits, uh, wells that have been dug directly out of this revival. And it, it's just an awesome thing to see. So I want to share a couple of things with you about Australia, and then I'd like to uh, for you to hear some of our worship from down under. I brought some CDs, our, our books and tapes. I won't go into the trouble of mentioning them in detail, but my book, The Apostolic Revolution, and others are back in the foyer there, along with these Australian worship CDs. But before we hear it, let me tell you a little bit about what God's doing in my country. About 20 years ago, we had an absolute breakout of the Spirit. It was, without a question, uh, even... I would think more than a revival. It was a total reformation of, of the Assemblies of God movement in Australia, a restoration of a movement that had lost its way completely. After almost 70 years of Pentecostal ministry in the country, there was little to show for that. Very few churches, small churches, but in the last 20 years, God has visited us in an awesome way. We have multiplied around 20 times in the last 20 years. There's been an overflowing visitation of God and a growth that is just sheerly phenomenal. Our largest church today, which is led by our general superintendent, our superintendents are pastors, and our general superintendent's church has grown in the last few years. It's 20 years old in August, and he planted that church. Today it numbers 21,000 people which is more than what our whole movement was just 20 years ago. You see, God has come in an awesome way. Today, there are many, many churches across the land, thousands strong. We've had the release of thousands of ministers into the work of God, hundreds of women in a ministry. Uh, we've seen the rise of young people in a phenomenal way. The average age of the church where my wife and I have our membership, it's a church around 2,000 strong. The average age is 24. Uh, we, many of the others are around the same age, 23, 24. There's been an awesome youth in gathering in our land. But one of the great things that God has done is raise up another kind of leadership. That's the key to it all. 
the fact that God gave us apostolic leadership instead of bureaucratic leadership. And it's changed the way things are completely. And our country is now a testimony to that fact of what can happen. In the last 20 years, we've gone from not even showing up on the national census. Today, our, our churches are the largest church attending group in the nation. And we're poised to make an incredible impact on our land. You can't go anywhere in Australia today where either an Assembly of God church or a Pentecostal church is, is either the largest church in the community or the largest building in the community or impossible to ignore anymore. How many people know that's the ultimate insult in church life when the world can ignore you? It's better if they hate you or love you, but not to ignore you. Well, God has helped us in an incredible way and we're blessed. And uh, in one of the churches that, that I visit uh, from time to time is, a, is in our southern capital, Adelaide. It's pastored by one of our young apostles uh, whom God raised up with an incredible ministry. Seven years ago, he planted this church. It's running around 3,000 today. And this is the worship that's coming out of that church. Let's hear it. Give us an open heaven. 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 Why don't we all stand? I would like you just to reach out to God with me right now before we open the word of the Lord. There are people here from many communities across the country. Some of you have driven long distances to be here tonight. And I want to pray with you for an open heaven in every community. God gave Brownsville an open heaven. It's happened in my country. I want to believe with you that in your town, in your city, where you come from, an open heaven by the grace of God. Now, Heavenly Father, we invoke the awesome outpouring of the Holy Spirit, your incredible grace. We ask, O oh Lord, that you will visit every community represented in this place tonight, that every town, every village, every place from which people have come will feel the awesome impact of a visitation of the Holy Ghost. We pray for your power to be manifest for your presence to rise, for your glory to be seen. Now, Lord God Almighty, we lay hold of that in the name of Jesus Christ, the Lord of all. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 Glory to God. Glory to God. Amen. Please be seated. In a few moments' time, I'm going to turn you to some passages in the New Testament. But before I get there, I would like to open this idea up with you. I want to speak to you tonight about adoption. What it means to be adopted by the grace of God into the family of God. What that really means. I want to tell you that there are some weird, sentimental, religious ideas that get loose in the church. And it's really time to correct some of that to get a hold of what the truth of God's Word is. Oftentimes, we read the Bible through 21st century eyes. We put our meanings on what the Scripture was. And it's good for us to lay hold of how things happened in the, in the days that the Bible was written so that we fully understand God's intention for us 
and his church. It would be easy for me tonight to say that it would, God would find it hard to recognize his church in much of the earth. You know that there are around 2.3 billion people on the earth who claim to be Christian. Most of them simply know which church they're staying away from. There are people who have a passing relationship with the Almighty God. They turn up at Easter or Christmas or at weddings or funerals, but that's all. There is no heart relationship. There is no transformed life. There is no indwelling presence of God. There is no manifestation of Jesus in them. Habits are not broken. Sin is not dealt with. It would be very difficult for God to recognize his church as many people call the church. And we don't want to be in any way critical of that. It's simply a fact of life, but it's good for us to know what we're dealing with. But there are mainly five reasons, I think, why God would find it hard to recognize his church. When you think of what God created, the Bible says that Jesus loved the church and he gave himself for it, that he may present it to the Father as a sweet smelling savor unto God. To think that Jesus would give his life to bring into being something that was so precious that God would value it highly. In the book of Ephesians 1, Paul says, I'm praying for you that the Lord God will give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Christ so that your eyes will be flooded with light, the eyes of your heart, that is, flooded with revelation so that you might know, number one, how important we are to God, that we are the riches of His inheritance in the saints. Do you know that we actually make God rich? He chose us out of the earth. He made us a prized jewel. He cleaned us, washed us, redeemed us, restored us, and prepared us. There are five reasons, I think, why God would find it hard to recognize what he created in the earth. First of all, there are those who are unclean. We know that sin is a major issue among those who call the name of Jesus. Some of them in just a passing way, some in a more distinct way. There are members of churches and, 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 and deacons and elders and Sunday school superintendents whose lives are not clean by the blood of Jesus, going through the motions, just going through the program, doing what they've learned to do. They've learned to walk the walk and talk the talk. But there are many that are unclean in what is called the church. But there are also many that are uncommitted. People who are just there for what's in it for them. For them, church is fire insurance. It's just sort of a backup plan, just in case. But they're not committed to the cause, not living for Jesus. I say that you live that way, you can get just enough religion to make you miserable. Because honestly, the only way the Christian life works is pedal to the metal. Full on, all the way. Give it everything you've got. A hundred percent commitment. That's the only way it works. We have a saying emerging in my country that I deplore. I hope it isn't here, but this philosophy is, is large in our society. They call it, go with the flow. Just take it easy, man. Just chill out. Let's not get caught up in all of this. We, we you know, just... Do what comes naturally. Don't, don't make such a, a big thing of things. Look, everybody's doing it. Just go with the flow. Well, that's where uncommitment comes from. And I have to tell you, any dead fish can float downstream with the current. You want to go with the flow? Any dead fish can do that. Takes no talent takes no commitment, no life, but it takes one that's live and kicking to swim against the tide to go the opposite way. 
So we have those who are unclean and those who are uncommitted. And basically they make up that part of the professing church that is either reprobate or is backslidden. We know where that is. And I don't want to concentrate so much on that, but just a statement, we know where that is. But there are three other kinds of people in the church, in my estimation, that we do really have to do something about. There are those who are unworthy, who constantly feel that they will never, ever be accepted by God. Feel constantly under the load and weight, and the devil is there putting his finger on the scales, saying, you'll never make it. God doesn't love you. God could never use you. I pastored long enough and pastored thousands of people to know that's the truth. Many good, kind, wonderful people who love God but never seem to get through that issue, live under condemnation all the time. And then there are those who are unaware. They simply are totally oblivious to what is their inheritance in God. They learn their bad habits from other Christians. They just go and do what others do. They get very religious. You're only going to listen to them pray sometimes. I say to them, if you talk to your earthly father like you talk to your heavenly father, he'd slap you. <laughs> just religious nonsense that comes out of their mouth without thinking because it's not a hard issue. They're totally unaware of their inheritance, so they settle for religion. And then there are those who are unable. These three I am really concerned about. Those who are unworthy, those who are unaware, and those who are unable to do the work and will of God. I have to tell you, men and women, that God saved us for a purpose. When the Bible says in the book of Romans chapter 5 that He has given to us through Jesus abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness, you have to know that that is not just so we can go to heaven. That is basic entry-level salvation. God saved us for a purpose. And I want to unpackage this idea with you tonight. I want to get it out of my heart, burning into your heart by the revelation of the Spirit so that every one of us can know why we have been chosen by God, why we have been apprehended by the Spirit, what God's purpose and plan is for every one of us. The definition of righteousness, it means to be able to stand in the Father's presence without fear or condemnation. To be able to stand in God's presence and know that you are not disqualified. To know that you are welcome there. That, that the presence of God was made for us. That God is not remote and austere and far from us. But through the blood of Jesus and through the rending of His flesh, there is a new and living way made into the presence of God. Amen. My youngest son, Andrew, is now 27, but when he was just a little boy, uh, he was in our Christian school on our church campus. And so we'd drop him at school in the morning, and at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, school would be out. And uh, a few minutes after 3, every afternoon, my door would burst open, and in would come Andrew with his school bag, drop that on the floor, jump up on my knee, and say, hey, Dad, you got a dollar for a Coke? My secretary's got really offended about this. Finally, my personal assistant came to me and said, Pastor, you've got to stop him. No one else is allowed to do this. Everyone else has got to go through the protocol. They've got to get an appointment. Nobody else can just storm through the office complex and come into your office. And oftentimes Andrew would come in in the middle of an important meeting. We'd be in a board meeting or an interview. Or I said to them, let's get one thing straight around here. Andrew is welcome anytime he wants to come. I never, ever want to send him a message that he has to make an appointment to see his dad. I don't care if the mayor of the city is with me. Andrew can come when he feels like it. We are welcome in the Father's presence. We are welcome there. God desires us. That's what this whole worship idea is all about. You felt that. You start worshiping and something happens between you and God. There's electricity between us. There's something happening. You can't help yourself. You just want to get your hands in the air. We are welcome there. 
But many people never approach the presence of God because of a sense of unworthiness. Now, if that unworthiness is due to disqualification, it better be dealt with and dealt with quickly. And only the blood of Jesus can do that. No amount of human effort, no amount of grinding it out will get you there. You have to come with faith in the blood of Jesus to cleanse and cleanse absolutely. But we must deal with this whole issue of being unworthy before Almighty God because you can never be used of God and you can never express faith while ever that is on your life. I heard a story, I, I'm not sure if it's true, but I heard a story about a spirit-filled Catholic priest who had a lady in his church who was just a little odd. She was one of those people that's always talking to God, you know, personally. <laughs> and after a little bit, the priest had got, he'd got ticked off with her constantly coming, telling him, the Lord said this to me and the Lord said that. And so he thought he would try and deflate her a little. So he said to her, the next time you're talking to God, he said, why don't you ask him, what was that special sin I committed in college? Because nobody but he and I know. She said, okay. <laughs> the next week, he sees her coming down the aisle and he thought he'd be smart. He said to her, uh, did you ask God about that thing we spoke about? Oh, she said, yes, I did. He started to get a little nervous. He, he, he said, uh, 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 did the Lord say anything to you? She said, yes, he did. By now, he's got a big lump in his throat. And, and he said, uh, 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 what did the Lord say? She said, the Lord said to me, I can't remember. You see, men and women, the problem is we remember and the devil remembers. Of all of the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, that Jesus took away and nailed to his cross, before that happened, the devil made some photocopies. And every once in a while, he'll deliver them to your house. Say, so see what you did? You feel as though you've got no right to come to God, even though you have dealt with it. Even though you have come and believed in Jesus, He reminds you of past sins God forgets, but we do not. That's the burden that we bear. But to live in the consciousness of our total forgiveness and acceptance by God and the power of the blood to really cleanse. There are men and women in this room who are seeking cleansing, who need cleansing. But you can hear this word from me tonight, an absolute guarantee and promise that if you come with an open heart, a repentant spirit, a deep desire for change, the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, will cleanse you from all sin, from all sin, all sin. Hallelujah, hallelujah. But men and women, I have to tell you, if that's all we have, if that's all we have, we only have basic entry-level salvation. God did all that for us for a purpose. The goal of God is not our redemption, but it is our adoption into His family. And I want to speak to you about what that means. You see, God is determined to fill the earth with people just like his son. What does it mean to be Christ-like, to be godly? You often hear people say that. Oh, he's a godly person, or he's a Christ-like person, or she's a wonderful, godly Christian. What does that mean? Oftentimes it means that they're kind, nice people who never rock the boat, who are inoffensive, don't do anything wrong, who live by a good moral and ethical standard. But men and women, I have to tell you that being godly, being Christ-like involves more than that. All that, but more. The life and ministry of Jesus 
is the only model we have to go by. And we have not only his moral and ethical standard to draw upon, but the awesome authority that he was invested with by the Father, an authority that had power over every other power in the earth and the universe. And God's intention is to fill the world with people just like Jesus. I'm going to take the trouble to read you quite a bit of Scripture. A few passages, first of all, from the book of Galatians and chapter 3, verse 26. This is what it says. You are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abram's seed and heirs according to the promise. What I'm saying is that as long as the heir is a child, he is no different from a slave, although he owns the whole estate. Do you know that there are people in the family of God living like slaves because they are unaware of God's purpose for them. He is subject to guardians and trustees until the time set by the Father. So also when we were children, we were in slavery under the basic principles of the world. But when the time had fully come, God sent His Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, that we might receive the full rights of sons. Because you are sons, God has sent the Spirit of His Son into our hearts, the Spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And since you are a son, God has also made you an heir. Now listen to Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 5. He predestined us to be adopted as His sons through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure. In the book of Hebrews 11 and 6, it says, without faith, it is impossible to please God. Now, some people sort of make a law out of that. Unless you do this and do this and do this, you'll never please God. As though God is austere waiting for us to fulfill our list of chores. And then as we tick them all off, he says, oh, well, I'm pleased with that. But that's not what it means. It means that when we live by faith, this is the only thing in all the world that can actually give God pleasure. What He draws pleasure from is that we are living by the same life source as Himself, that we are motivated by the same power as He Himself is, that His nature is now being replicated in us. We are called sons. In the book of Romans, and this is a wonderful part of the Bible, Romans chapter 8 and just two more verses. And we read this in Romans 8 and 29. For those God foreknew, He also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of His Son, that He might be the firstborn among many brethren. And then we read also in Romans chapter 8 and in verse 15. Now if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share His sufferings in order that we might also share His glory. This is an amazing part of the Bible, and it tells us what God is up to. When He uses that word in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 5, and in Romans chapter 8 and verse 29, the word predestination or predestined, all it means is that God wrote our destiny in advance. That our destiny is not whether we are going to be saved or lost, as some people would falsely teach, but to be predestined means that God intends to conform us to the likeness of Jesus, that He won't be the only one of God's sons in the earth, that we will be like Him that we will manifest His glory, that we will show the world what Jesus is truly like. So let me explain to you 
what the process of adoption was in ancient times. You see, we color this part of the Bible by our modern concept of adoption. We tend to think of that, I've often heard it preached, that, you know, we were homeless strays, lost in the world of sin and wickedness. But God in His love and mercy found us and He brought us into His family and He gave us a home and He gave us security. We were adopted. Men and women, nothing could be further from the truth. What adoption meant in ancient times was this, that a boy might be growing up in a well-to-do family, but he was under the control of what was called the pedagogue, he, the tutor that his master had employed, often a slave, who would look after that young boy and often treat him very brutally to train him in the ways of the family. But he was under the law, he was under control. But there came a day when that boy had grown to manhood, generally around 30 years of age. And then, on a special day, in a special ceremony, the father would take his son and heir, and he would bring him to the city gate, or to the Roman Forum or Agora, as the case might have been, and set him before the Senate or the elders of the city, and there he would declare that he acknowledged his son now fully grown and mature and able to carry on the family business in his own name. There he would be invested with the signet ring of the family and from that time on, his word was the same as his father's word. He carried the authority of his father. He had been invested with the full right of sonship to carry on the family business. Now, men and women, that is exactly what God the Father did with His own Son, Jesus. For 30 years, Jesus was in obscurity. He went down to, Gal to Nazareth, the Bible says, with His, his parents, uh, Mary and His foster father, Joseph, and the Bible says He was subject to them. And He grew in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. But during those 30 years of his life, not one supernatural thing happened. Contrary to popular belief, he was not working miracles while he was lying in the manger. Nothing supernatural happened in Jesus' life until he was 30 years of age. And then on that day at Bethabara, in the Jordan River, where he met his cousin John the Baptist and was baptized in water to fulfill all the requirements of righteousness. But coming out of the water, John said this, I saw the Spirit descending like a dove and remaining on him. And there was a voice from heaven that spoke and said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. On that day, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit and the voice of the Father acknowledged Jesus' sonship. And from that day on, things were different. He was adopted by the Father. He was set forth before the world now, fully mature, invested with the authority of the Father, to carry out the family business. And men and women, if you have any doubt about that, you just read in Matthew chapter 4 what the temptation was all about. It was all on the basis of his sonship. If you be the Son of God, turn these stones to bread. The devil was challenging his change status. He had an inkling of what was coming. Within six weeks from that day, the Bible records in Mark's Gospel, chapter 1, that Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit into Galilee. He is preaching in the synagogue at Capernaum where he has been many times before. But unlike every time before, when Jesus took the scroll and began to speak, suddenly a man began to scream out, under the power of an evil spirit, 
And Jesus took authority over that evil power that had been hidden in that man's life. Most likely, it had never manifested like that before. But today, things were different than they were before. There was something that was patently and obviously different to that demon power that had never felt the need to expose itself before, but today it could not hide the manifest presence of the Son of God in that synagogue had drawn the thing out of its hiding place. And Jesus spoke the word of authority and cast the spirit out. Now, men and women, what you need to hear is this. That was the very first time in human history that an evil spirit had ever been ejected from a human personality. No exorcism had ever successfully happened before that time. Saul, the king of Israel, had an evil spirit, but there was no deliverance for him. He was pacified by the music of David's harp. You can read the Old Testament from Genesis to Malachi, not a single account of anyone ever being delivered by an evil spirit, and I'll tell you why. Because there was nobody, not Abraham, not David, not Solomon, not Daniel, not Joseph, not the most wonderful of those ancient patriarchs who ever had authority over demons. Every one of them were disqualified because in their life there were the powers of sin still not broken. They were under the law. The cleansing of the blood of Jesus had not yet come to break that power forever in their life. And there wasn't anybody who could walk upon the planet who was free of that taint until Jesus came. He was acknowledged by the Father as his son and the very first supernatural thing he ever did was to break the power of spirits in human lives. You've got to see how important this is. They got clever in our day. They tell us that there aren't any such things anymore. John Calvin, the great Reformation theologian, told us, along many other things he told us we didn't need anymore, including apostles and prophets and miracles. He told us we didn't need the ministry of exorcism because all the evil spirits were withdrawn from the earth at the end of the first century. News to me. Somebody's carrying on their business. There's more darkness in the world today than we have ever known. There's more light too. Because there are more people rising up knowing their authority in Jesus. Knowing that they have the adoption of sons, that they have the right to carry on the family business. You see, men and women, we haven't been saved to go to heaven. This salvation we have is not some form of fire insurance that simply gets us there across the line, saved by the skin of our teeth. We have been redeemed by the blood of Jesus in order that we might be conformed to the image of God's Son, that God might invest in us the authority to challenge the way things are in our world and turn things around for the glory of his name. When Jesus preached his very first sermon, he quoted from Isaiah the prophet, chapter 61, and he read it from that scroll of the prophet, and he said this, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because. I wonder if you get it. There is always a because to the anointing. There are lots of people in our world who claim to be full of the Spirit. And please hear me very carefully. Don't run away with a half statement. But all they can do is speak in tongues. Do I like that? Oh, I love that. I pray in the Spirit every day. All day. I love that. But if that's all we have, it's not enough. Jesus said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach deliverance to the captives, the opening of the prison to those that are bound. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted. The Amplified Bible says, 
those who are bruised by the calamities of life. He has sent me to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. But men and women, there are multitudes of people who claim to be filled with the Spirit and they can speak in tongues, but they can't deliver the captives. They can't do the family business. You see, the only reason why we are anointed and the whole purpose of our redemption is so that God may conform us to the image of His Son, that we also may be deliverers of those who are bound, that our lives may be invested with the authority of the Son of God because of the anointing. Not just the blessing of the anointing, but the because of the anointing. You see, the family business is healing the sick, delivering the captives, casting out evil spirits, turning men from darkness to light. You read it in Paul's statement of why he was chosen. He said, when he called me, he chose me. He sent me with this mandate that I might deliver the captives from the kingdom of Satan and transfer them to the kingdom of God's dear Son, that I might open their eyes, turn them from darkness to light. This is the mandate of every one of us. Every one of us. We have this right, this authority. This is the adoption of sons to do the work and ministry of Jesus. The modern church has been hijacked by a word only gospel. The church is drowning in speeches. Just words. Just words. No deeds. No breakthrough. No answer. No solution. I want to tell you, men and women, we have an authority in the name of Jesus that is all too little invoked. And there are some people who have put a bizarre twist on all of this and gone to extreme lengths. We know that. But we're talking about the vast bulk of God's people who aren't silly, but hunger for significance and reality and a manifestation of true power that does bring deliverance to the captives. I was only a boy. We began in ministry, Mary and I. We graduated from the college. Too green to know which way was up. We went out with a passion in our heart to serve God. The very first thing I got confronted with was a lady who, uh, as I visited her in a home on a Saturday afternoon, an elderly lady, she said, you know, just excuse me, I, ha I have a sore neck. And this is my first exposure. I'm just beginning, I'm knocking on doors, I'm trying to reach out to people to plant a new church. I said, oh, I'd be glad to pray for you. I noticed that she was a believer, her Bible was open on the table. I had a look, I noticed it was open to Mark 16. Well, I thought I got a live one. I didn't know how live. We finished the prayer. I got up from where I was sitting and walked around the table and laid hands on this lady. I'm just a boy. I'm 23 years of age. You're not old enough to even be safe then. I mean, all you got is a heart full of passion and not much knowledge, and that's what I had. But I prayed for this lady with enthusiasm. God, heal her. God, deliver her of this sore neck. And the strangest thing happened. The power of God fell on this woman. I, I went to an Assembly of God Bible school, so you have to forgive me. I'd never seen that happen before. <laughs> I went to a school where they were constantly making excuses why the power of God was not manifest today. Where our lecturers dragged the Bible down to the level of their experience. The favorite slogan of our college was, blessed is he who expecteth nothing, for he shall not be disappointed. <laughs> so this lady fell out under the power. I mean, she slumped in her chair. And I waited and waited and waited and waited, and she didn't come around. I don't know what to do. It wasn't in the manual. <laughs> I waited and waited, and she didn't come around, so finally I excused myself to her prone body and left. 
Well, what would you have done? That looks so clever right now. Two weeks later, I brought my wife back and we went to visit. She opened the door, she saw me, she reached out and grabbed me by the coat lapels and said, where on earth have you been? I, I said, is there something I should know? She said, well, don't you know? I said, well, tell me. She said, well, I was healed. Well, I said, I expected that. She said, but you don't understand. I didn't just have a sore neck, I had a broken neck. Then she told the most amazing story. She had had osteoarthritis through her whole body. 18 months before she'd been at her doctor, he was giving her a physical examination and he said to her, Mrs. Radcliffe, you should have more movement in your neck than that. And he gave her a quick manipulation and snapped her neck. She began hemorrhaging at the base of the neck. She was wearing a brace every day. That day she had taken the brace off and she was sitting at the table crying when I came. She was reading Mark 16, saying, Lord, when are you going to send somebody to me who will lay hands on me? The elders of my church will not do that. Her husband was one of the elders. She was in an evangelical church. They believed that all miracles had passed away at the end of the first century or with the death of the last apostle. Pity they hadn't kept reading. They haven't all died yet. She said, I've asked the elders to pray for me and they won't. They say it'll hold the church up to ridicule because nothing will happen. Lord, when are you going to send somebody to me that will lay? And she was reading Mark 16. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. And the tears were falling on the page. And while she's praying this prayer, a 23-year-old boy is knocking on the door. She got instantly healed of a broken neck. That set the town alight. We had a succession of miracles happen as a direct result of that first miracle and a church was planted in the power of the Spirit. You see, this mandate of Jesus is the only mandate that we have to live by, to bring the power of God to people. Instead of words alone, instead of cute sermons and speeches alone, there must be a demonstration, but there must be more than that. There must be an empowerment of all of God's people to do the work of Jesus because Paul says we have all received this adoption of sons. Jesus said to his disciples, in whatsoever city or town you go, heal the sick that are therein and declare unto them the kingdom of God is come nigh unto you. You can study your gospels as much as you want. And you will find this amazing fact that invariably when Jesus uses the term the kingdom of God, it is associated with healing the sick and casting out devils. You see, people, the kingdom of God is not some mysterious thing, some geopolitical institution that's going to emerge during the millennial reign alone. The kingdom of God is where the kingdom of Satan is vanquished. And it's here and now. Wherever God's people find their authority, find their adoption, that they have the right to carry on the family business, which is delivering the captives and extending the kingdom of God. This is what Jesus said, I do only those things I see the Father doing. This is the family business. Before his adoption and baptism in the Spirit, not a miracle, not a deliverance, not even a sermon, but now anointed, enabled, empowered, and recognized by his Father, set forth before the world as a deliverer, as one with the adoption of sons. There is an immediate breakthrough, and there is hope in the earth. In the book of Acts chapter 1, verse 1, I read this amazing statement. Luke writing to his friend Theophilus says, of all that Jesus began, 
to do and to teach. Of all that he began to do and to teach. He only began it, people, but he was doing. Peter says this of him in Acts 10, 38, how that God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, and he went about doing good healing all who were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. We read it in Luke chapter 8, how that he went about teaching and showing the glad tidings of the kingdom of God. There are not just words with Jesus. There is a demonstration of the power of God that brings deliverance to people. This is our calling. That is what the adoption of sons is all about. That's authority. In 1540, one of the reformers, a man by the name of Martin Luther, well known, I'm sure, to everybody in this room, had an incredible experience. He had been something of a cessationist, that is, a person like John Calvin who believed that all miracles had passed away in the first century. And there was no need of them now. But something happened to Martin Luther that changed his mind. He received a letter from his friend Myconius, Frederick Myconius, who was the principal of one of the schools and was working with Luther in bringing this reformation further. He got this letter telling him that he was dying and that he would never see him again and bidding him farewell. Something snapped in Luther's heart. And something of the faith of God began to rise up in this man that was to change his life. He wrote back to Myconius, and this is what he wrote. I command you in the name of God to live because I still have need of you in the work of reforming the church. The Lord will never let me hear that you are dead, but will permit you to survive me. For this I am praying, this is my will, and may my will be done, because I seek only to glorify the name of God. In essence, what Luther said to Myconius was, this is God's will, and it is my will. I have to tell you people that until God's will is our will, nothing happens. Until we determine to align ourselves with the will and purpose of God and lay a hold of the authority that has been given us in Jesus' name on the basis of us being cleansed by the blood, accepted, adopted, set forth before the world with authority, unless we lay hold of that, nothing happens. Reinhard Bonnke, probably the most effective harvesting evangelist the world has ever known in terms of numbers of people coming to Christ. Recently, in Lagos, Nigeria, in one meeting, a word of prophecy that had been spoken over Bonki some years before was fulfilled before his eyes. The word of prophecy was, the day will come when you will see a million people come to Christ in a single service. That has never happened in human history. But it did in Lagos, Nigeria, where 1.1 million people gave their lives to Christ in a single service. <laughs> where more than 6 million people committed themselves to Christ and signed decision cards in one week. Where during that crusade, over five 100,000 people were baptized in the Holy Spirit in a single service. If you've ever seen the video, it is just unbelievable. They were mowed down like a scythe had gone through them. But Reinhard Bonnke says this, I was a pretty average missionary until Jesus said to me, my word in your mouth is as powerful as as my word in my mouth. Religion will rob you from laying hold of that. 
sentimental religion will pull you back to safe territory. Sentimental religion will say, oh no, that sounds like pride. We've got some funny ideas about what pride and humility are. Let me tell you people, it is not humility to deny the grace of God in your life. It is not humility to deny what God has called you to be and do. He sent you to be a deliverer. One of the reasons why the world is in the state it is is because the church does not believe that it has been sent and empowered by the living God to do the work of Jesus. It's been my privilege to be on the Church Growth International Board for many years. We first met Dr. John Hurston there in Seoul, Korea. And that church is basically from its very inception, from the time that Dr. Hurston and Dr. Cho worked together to raise that work of God up has been built on miracles, signs and wonders, breakthroughs, supernatural power. I said to Dr. Cho one day at breakfast, I got a private breakfast with him, and, and I said, Dr. Cho, you, you tell us all the principles and you, you run us through 14 things you must do, 16 things you must do. You, every time it's the same. You must pray, you must fast, you must live a holy life, you must vision, you must dream, set goal, all of this. But I said, would you in just a sentence. Tell me, what is the difference between your church and most of the churches in the Western world? Oh, he said, that's easy. He said, our people have discovered the power of God for themselves. Well, I said, how does that happen? He said, well, when they come for counseling, we send them to prayer mountain. We say, you pray and fast for three days and seek God for yourself. And if they ever come back and say that didn't work, we say, you go back to prayer mountain and pray and fast for seven days. <laughs> and if they ever come back and say, I still have my problem and it didn't work, we say, you go back to prayer mountain and pray and fast for 40 days. <laughs> they never come back. <laughs> but what an awesome thing it is to discover that you have authority with God. That, you're, that He listens to your word. That like Martin Luther, that you can lay hold of things that need to be done and changed. There's a sensitivity in the Holy Spirit that guides us. We just don't do flippant things. But as the Lord puts in our heart the things that need to be done, there is a right and an authority in Jesus' name to bring deliverance to the captives. I finish with this thought. It's well known to us. Jesus taught his disciples to pray. He said to them, this is how you pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now, men and women, I know that there probably aren't a lot of Greek scholars in this room, but anyone who is a Greek scholar will tell you that that statement in the prayer, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven is not a request. It is a command. It's a declaration. It means that Jesus taught us to synchronize our praying with the will of God to lay hold of God's intention for people and to speak into reality things that ought to be, to bring deliverance to the captives, to speak freedom into their lives to bring a declaration of God to their lives. And you have the right and authority to do that. We're not talking about mindless, flippant statements. We're talking about people who know their authority in God, who prayed through until the will of God has been impressed upon their spirit, but then they can say, it is your will and it is my will that this be done. In Jesus' name. Now, men and women, at the end of this service, this is what I want to say to you. I know that in this room tonight, there is a great cross-section of people as I've prayed all day and looked to God about this. I felt very much the weight of this upon my heart because I know that there are men and women's lives, some of you, literally, as it were, hanging in the balance. There are men and women in this room tonight being brought to this meeting for a purpose. 
a friend, a neighbor, a relative brought you because they were so desperately concerned about your soul. They know that you're not living right, that you, your heart is not synchronized with God, that you're in the grip of Satan, that the power of sin is still manifest within you. And someone brought you here because they love you, because they're desperately concerned to see you get a breakthrough. And there are men and women in this room who were drawn by the Spirit of God to come. And the Holy Spirit has drawn you back into a house like this where you could feel the presence of God again. Even though your heart has grown cold, you're what we call a backslider. And there are other people in this room, many I suspect, who are really confused. Confused about whether God really accepts them or not. Some have come to this altar time after time and they've prayed and they said, oh God, forgive me. And they've gone out and the devil says, God doesn't love you. You got around that circle another time and another time until you got in the groove that maybe this is the way it will be forever. But I want to tell you that there is a place of freedom here. There is a breakthrough. There is a release. If you've never given your life to Christ, if you're in the power of sin and you need to be set free, there is deliverance here. If you're a backslider and your heart has grown cold, men and women, this is where the fire burns again. This is where the Spirit rises. This is where life flows. This is where you find fellowship with the Father that you've lost touch with. And if you're confused, this is where the power of discouragement and deception is broken as the Word of life is prayed over you. I'm going to ask you, if this is in your heart and you know that you need to make a move toward God, without a moment's hesitation, without any delay, I want you to get from your seat and just come and stand here at the front and reach out to God. Cry out to God with all your heart for a breakthrough. It'll happen. I've done the same. Many others have done the same. But if this is your night to reach God, do it now and don't hesitate. Do it now, right now. You've never given your life to Christ. You're a backslider. Your heart is cold. You're a person who's confused about your relationship with God. Quickly come and stand here at the front or kneel or reach out to God. Don't wait for anybody to come to you. This is business between you and God alone. And God will reach you and He will meet you. And there will be a change and a victory will happen. Glory be to God. I know what that's like. I know what that's like. Now in the name of Jesus, as the Spirit of God is speaking to you, come quickly and reach out to God. This is your moment. This is your moment. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We're waiting. We're waiting. We're waiting. We're waiting. We're waiting. From the gallery, from everywhere, they're coming. Hallelujah. That's right. That's right. Hallelujah. 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 This is God's work being done. There is a breakthrough here. There is freedom here. The Spirit of the Lord is here. Now let God's work be done in every one of us. It's not my style to plead and beg with people because I have this view in my heart that everybody knows what their situation is and that God can speak to you in exactly the same way that He speaks to me. So sir, lady, young person, whoever you are, if this is your moment of opportunity, don't let it pass by. Deal with God right now. Get a breakthrough. Let the Spirit of the Lord come to you. Bring revelation to you about what it means to really be set free. Don't hesitate a moment. Do it now in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Amen. Pastor. Amen. Can we have our altar workers come and help us, please? We need some help up here. I'm going to ask those of you that sit at the altar, if you will, to stand, please. I'm going to ask everybody to stand. Those of you that are part of our prayer team, if you will, come quickly. Those of you that's kneeling, would you just stand, if you don't mind, please? If you just, if you just stand. I'm going to have someone come right now, and they're going to pray with you. They're going to give you some personal attention. They're going to give you some material after they get through praying. We're going to get some information on you. But right now, I want the audience just to extend your hand this way, and let's pray that God will do a powerful work in their lives right now. Just break all that stuff off of them. Will you do that right now? Help me pray. Jesus, 
Do your work, Holy Spirit. Do your work, Holy Spirit. There's a lot of tears up here. Come on, church, help me pray. Yes, Lord, yes, Lord. I want everybody to have a worker with them, please. Everybody that's standing here needs to have a prayer counselor with them, a worker. Take my heart, take my heart and form it. Take my mind, transform it. Take my will, conform it to your could help us we want to move these chairs on the front if you have some items there if you can gather those up they're going to help us we're going to continue to work with these at the altar but we're going to pray for folks tonight that want to receive prayer how many of you came to brownsville to get prayer tonight hallelujah i remember when i used to drive all night to get here just to be in service so i get prayed for two or three times four or five hallelujah we've got a team that's anointed by god tonight ready to pray for you they're prayed through. Oh, it's not that the people in Brownsville are special. We're just hanging around Jesus. When you hang around Jesus, something rubs off on you. Hallelujah. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. I'm going to ask those of you that are here for the first time. You've never been to Brownsville before. You'd like prayer tonight. Would you come down first? Our prayer team workers are going to get ready in just a minute. But we want to pray for you first this evening. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. Everybody, everybody needs to get prayer tonight. Some of you have come a long way. Don't miss the opportunity to receive prayer in this anointed house of God. Amen. Prayer team, God bless you. Help us pray tonight.